morning. I hope you are all well and safe and um, are uh, all well at home. I think now it's only started to stream live. So I'll start again. Hello, everyone. It's one o'clock. So we'll start our little webinar from the Greens EFA group. Um, I hope you're all well and safe and also your families. So you will see um, both um, the co-chairs of the Greens EFA group. So that's me, Skag Hello, hello, and Philippe Lombert, who is uh, also there to be seen. And uh, yesterday we have uh, as group voted on, so decided on a green recovery plan, because uh, as you know, the Corona crisis is still upon us. Uh, there is much to do in terms of staying safe, making sure that uh, the virus doesn't spread, that it's being contained. But we also have to start thinking about the economic recovery afterwards and what we want to change um, in um, our economy and the way of how we live and work together after we have um, overcome the immediate threat which is certainly not there yet but we still need to think ahead so as greens we've made a, a plan about uh, that and you can find the whole plan on our website it's uh, an extensive plan because it's an extensive task but nonetheless, we want to try to present that to you this noon. So I'll just start with giving you some headlines. Then Philippe will maybe go more into the details. And then we'll also ask, uh, see all your questions. You'll have to put them in by writing. I'm sure that was explained somewhere. Um, so um, what is important about our common plan, which is uh, here you can see it once, um, is uh, that we are saying that we want to Go out of the crisis, not into an old business, like not into the old normal, but we want to together create a more resilient, sustainable and uh, strong way of living together and a fair way of living together. So we want to develop further and progress in our uh, societies, in our European Union, and not just return simply to what was before. One of the important lessons to learn from this crisis, we believe, is that we need to invest, is invest more into our health system to make sure it's resilient so that we can uh, face also future crisis. We want to have an uh, economy in the future that is sustainable because um, yeah, the climate crisis hasn't gone away, the biodiversity crisis hasn't gone away. So we need to make sure that the investments that we need to make and which are necessarily going to be massive, that they're invested in the right way, that we're not um, putting huge amounts of uh, public and taxpayers money into the fossil industry, for example, but that we set some requirements for example, that uh, big businesses need to have a plan about how to, they are going to fulfill also uh, the Paris Agreement um, uh, targets. So for us, it's very important that the new economy that we're building will act within the limits of our planets, that this will also apply to our future food policy. We've seen that there is a bit of a problem with um, being not just in food, but also in other sectors being dependent very much on, um, on the global supply chains and that it's important that we think thoroughly about what is important that we have here in the European Union that where we're not dependent on global supply change, ch chains and that goes uh, certainly for food, which is a very obvious one, but also if we look at the industrial sector, we have to think carefully about which abilities the European Union needs to have um, I'm not going to go into very much details, but what is also important to our plan is that um, we think uh, we always have to look at the rule of law and human rights dimensions. Um, that goes very much for um, what happens internally in the European Union. If we look at Hungary, where the corona crisis is being used in order to uh, dismantle the parliament of Hungary, um, but also in a worldwide situation where we need to have global solidarity in order to help countries even more affected and even less prepared than many European countries. Indeed, we think we need to have a global response and global solidarity, and that's very important to us as well. And uh, we need to look also into the digital um, 
sphere, uh, we see now that uh, working digitally works in many areas more than maybe we thought before, but that there is also lots of um, challenges looking at data security, looking again at the abilities of European Union companies, for example, and that much more needs to be invested in making sure digitalization goes the way that we want it to go. Philippe, up to you. Uh, thank you, Oscar. Welcome, everyone. One thing is certain is that this crisis is shaking the very foundations of the ways all societies have been functioning the last uh, 30 or 40 years. Everything was predicated on the market, the market which was seen as the sole guarantor of efficiency, and efficiency was measured only by short-term profit. All of this has been deeply deeply shaken, including this idea that uh, faster, bigger, longer, further is always better. Uh, we discovered that actually uh, when it comes to protecting life, well, all these things uh, don't go a very long way in that direction and that we need a different way of shaping things. So this reminds us something that maybe some of us had forgotten is that life comes before profit. And so the first message of our, of our recovery package is that we it would be really uh, uh, very, very dramatic if all societies would simply come out of this crisis going back to the good old ways of doing things. There's no good old ways of doing things. And indeed, there, there may be things in the past that we, uh, that we like and want to carry over, but there's also stuff that we need to leave behind us. Uh, and I mentioned just a, a few of those. So the question is, are we going to seize the moment and basically to, uh, to take opportunity of the fact that all fundamental beliefs are shaken to build a society that is more just, that is more sustainable, that is also more democratic. And I know that uh, some of you may think that well, uh, the exit from the uh, uh, acute phase of the pandemic is fraught with dangers. Maybe I'm a more optimistic guy. Uh, I became a member of the European Parliament uh, 10 years ago, just in the aftermath of the financial crisis. And there's lessons to be taken from that time. Uh, that A, we have a window of opportunity to change things fundamentally. Back in time, we missed it to a large extent. But this goes much further. And so I do believe that the window of opportunity is opening itself. It is short with dangers, but also I think that all societies have again the opportunity to make choices. Scam mentioned the issue of uh, healthcare, which has been seen as a drag, as a burden, as something that would co uh, that would cost us a horrendous amount of money, a pognon dingue, as said uh, Emmanuel Macron. And now we start realizing that actually these are treasures uh, and they are worth investing in them. And I think not just of the systems, but I primarily think of the people uh, because this is a people-based uh, business, I would say. This is not really stuff. This is mostly about people taking care of other people. And so we have to realize that this is not a burden, it's a treasure of our societies. So you see, that's just one example of how we have to look uh, differently. I'd like to say a word about money because uh, many think, well, can we afford to uh, to reinvest? Can we afford to uh, to engage into the, the green transition? Can we afford to kickstart our economies in a different way? I would say when life is at stake, we have to do whatever it takes. So the question is not, can we afford it? The question is not, well, but do all budgetary rules as they currently stand allow us that? Uh, the question is not, is this basically good for the sh well, short term for the economy? The thing is, we have to do what it, whatever it takes to preserve life on this planet. Human life, of course, but uh, life in general, because we depend on, the, on, on other forms of life on this planet just to be able to survive here. And make no mistake about that, the climate challenge, the biodiversity challenge, the resource challenges, all these environmental challenges have not disappeared. Now, uh, so we can afford to invest. I mean. Europe is not a poor continent. The issue is that wealth is distributed in a way that is totally unjust in Europe. But we do have the means, the financial means, to really uh, transform our economies and make our economies work for everyone and not just for the happy few. And at the moment, we have heads of states and governments uh, in, across Europe still, still dithering. 
the impression that they give us is that, well, they're not so sure that solidarity uh, should be practiced, that actually they're not so sure they, they would be better off uh, acting together rather than individually. So this lack of commitment to solidarity is, of course, highly damaging for Europe, but not so with the Greens. I mean, the Greens stand united saying, we are in this together, we are going to come out of that successfully together, and only together. We can do it uh, uh, financially. That is not the question, so I won't enter into the details, but the question is, how do we mobilize the enormous wealth of this continent in order to transform it? The final word on democracy, because this is where I would share the grave concerns of many of our fellow citizens. It is true that in order to get out of the confinement, there's insistent uh, pressure to uh, go one or several steps further in the direction of the mass surveillance state. We know that we are in a mass surveillance capitalism that private companies and especially the majors uh, of the digital world want to spy on us day and night all the time. They want to know what we do, what we buy, how we speak, whom do we talk to and everything. And now we already had one, one uh, step in that direction after the terror attacks in Europe, but now it's magnified by the pandemic. And there's indeed a risk that states will abuse their uh, powers and basically use the sense of vulnerability of our, of our fellow citizens to force the mass deployment of surveillance tools. This will be a major attention point for us uh, because it's not a given that we are going to avoid that trap, but count on us to be uh, very uh, attentive to that. So much for my opening statements. Ska? Thank you. We have already received a lot of questions, which we're looking at in parallel, so don't uh, worry or don't be surprised if we're looking as if we're reading something, because we're reading your questions. Um, there's a lot of questions about uh, specific details, about specific sectors, and uh, maybe it's best if you look at also closely into the document itself because indeed there's a lot of questions on different sectors and there of course also a lot that we say about different sectors uh, both in our plan as well as we have a detailed action plan which is um, more cluster specific so um, anything we don't answer here or are not able to answer here because of the, the amount of questions and the shortage of time um, I'm sure you'll be able to find there. Now there were some questions about social equality and that's of course something that we also highlighted um, very much um, because I think one of the things that this crisis has uh, also shown again is that some um, jobs that have um, maybe been not so regarded so much before the crisis turn out now to be absolutely vital and important. If we're thinking, for example, about supermarket workers, if we're thinking about cleaners, if we're thinking about nurses, um, caring personnel. So uh, those are really a very, very important jobs. And uh, it's very good that we all always say thank you and uh, that we applaud to them. It's very, that's very important, I think, public recognition. But we also need to make sure that those jobs are being properly remunerated and that appreciation is not just shown in statements but also in the wage payments and that's something that we are um, uh, arguing for also in this paper and not to forget about the whole gender perspective in those jobs you mainly find uh, women who are underpaid who are um, often um, facing also uh, poverty in old age because they weren't able to save up for any pension um, and so on and so forth who are also in a double problem right now because um, they are usually the ones expected to do with children and uh, who are stuck at home but they at the same time have to do all this important work and have to go outside so they are more vulnerable more at risk um, of uh, corona and at the same time being uh, not enough uh, remunerated and paid for the jobs that they're doing. So that's something we stress very much in this paper and that is very important uh, to us. And Philippe, have you found a question or a couple of uh, questions? No? I, have, I have found a few. Uh, I, I'll start with, uh, with a question that comes from the Netherlands on can we make a, a 
say, rich countries in Europe uh, better aware, or, or, or the citizens of rich countries better aware of the, the financial benefits or the economic benefits that they drew from uh, the European integration. That's a very important question, and it's no surprise it comes from uh, the Netherlands, because what is at stake at the moment is a very grave choice that uh, heads of states and governments must make in the next few weeks as to whether we are going to have a common response to uh, uh, to the economic slump that we are facing or whether each country will be left on its own. And indeed, uh, say from rich countries, uh, this is pretty much framed in a sort of moralistic way. Uh, uh, and at best, what could be done is charity, but no more than that, because basically we have on the one hand virtuous people, and on the other hand, we have sinners. Actually, uh, you can see in economic policies of all member states, all member states, not just uh, uh, those in the South, stuff that actually damages our common interest and stuff that enhances our common interest. Uh, that's a fact. So you cannot think that whatever the Italian uh, uh, government has been doing has been harming the European Union, whereas everything that the German government has been doing economically for the last 30 years has been profitable for the European Union. The fact is that indeed, uh, most of the financial benefits accruing from the monetary integration and from the single market have gone to uh, countries like Germany, the Netherlands, uh, uh, Finland, Sweden, etc. That's a fact. I mean, if the if if these countries had been faced with a currency, say the Deutsche Mark back in time, that would have been a national currency, well, the, uh, the exchange rates of the Deutsche Mark would have been made it totally impossible for Germany to have its export-driven strategy. And, uh, and, and so the German miracle uh, would have simply not occurred. So we are interdependent on that. And yes, there are benefits accruing to the integration uh, in countries like Spain, like Portugal, but likewise, there's major, major, major profits uh, being made in, uh, in countries in the north. And so we should get out of this moralistic stance. It's not that there are virtuous countries and, 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 and sinful countries. We all are in this together, and it's a matter of common interest. I mean, look around us. Do you really think that Trump, Putin, Xi Jinping and others want Europeans to stick together? No. They want to divide us, and we should not let that happen. It's a matter of uh, common interest. Another question that I saw is about: Do we know? Uh, do, do we know how this virus came out, and, and uh, is this a consequence of uh, of the way we we treat nature? Uh, possibly, there's a lot of stuff that we don't know yet about uh, the origins of this virus and how it spreads and how it affects uh, the human body. So uh, there's still a lot of, of stuff that we need to discover. But indeed, we have to let the scientists work. And, and that's another area of, uh, of society that, that has been uh, profoundly left behind. It's public research. I mean, we have often disinvested uh, in our public research capacities to the benefit of private research. Uh, and we need to reinvest into that because, well, there's stuff that we need to understand that there's no direct economic uh, benefit attached to it, but it is hugely important for societies. And certainly, research on that is important. And uh, on that, I'd like to say that sometimes people say that the Greens don't like science. It's uh, the exact opposite. What we say is that we have to use all the science we can have, but in a way that allows us to use the precautionary principle. Whatever science tells us must be used in order to lead our societies in a way that avoids uh, uh, major damage. And indeed, oftentimes, when you hear uh, science-based politics uh, in the in the mouth of people defending agro-business, for instance, like the Monsantos of this world, what they want to say is that, well, unless science has proven something toxic, it is not. And this is the exact opposite of the precautionary principle. What we have done to climate, what we have done to biodiversity, what we have done uh, uh, re uh, relating to public health is the exact opposite of the precautionary principle. And make no mistake about that, the precautionary principle is written black on white, not just in a piece of law somewhere, in the basic EU treaty. So it's a constitutional obligation that we have to practice and that has been forgotten quite a while. Over to you, Ska. Thanks, and also a big shout out to all the listeners from the UK, especially to Catherine, who I see has uh, joined us. 
we miss you so much. Stay with us still for a while, hopefully. Um, more questions have been related also to uh, mindset and um, how do we make sure that um, people do make a change of mindset. But I do think that right now when we're all in this crisis, I think a lot of things are, um, are changing in all of our mindset, right? Because we see that things that maybe we thought are important before are not so important to us anymore, whereas other things that we never really thought about are becoming more important. That uh, relates to jobs that I have uh, mentioned already before, which jobs are important, but also about what is really important in our life and um, what's really important in our society. And for example, a focus on healthcare, a, a focus on making sure that uh, we have green spaces around, for example, that we can enjoy when we go out. Uh, that is something that I think is very much in all of our minds. And I do also think and that's related to another question that would, was put forward, that this change of mindset also relates to seeing how much actually political institutions and decisions make decision makers can do you know very often was said okay well you know what can politics actually do it's all economics and whatever but where it's all done decided by economic actors but we can see how much impact um, the political decision makers actually can have and how important it is that they are able to decide quickly in a crisis, involve also the opposition, for example, involve citizens and so on and so forth. So we really see how important it is to have decisions makers in place um, that we trust to make good decisions because uh, they are important. I mean, to use an outrageous example, maybe, but um, looking at Trump now, where maybe people have thought, oh my God, yeah, I know. What, what does it matter, please president or not, but now we really see how much it matters whether you have someone you trust at the helm or not, and how much influence uh, politics and uh, political decision makers actually have. So I do think um, that is also something that we will remember, for example, when we talk about the climate uh, action and uh, we hear again, oh, nothing can be done, you know, you have to follow the economic wheels, how they're turning. No, a lot of things can be done, can be done, um, and uh, it's better to be prepared. Um, other questions related to um, the economic support for sectors, which sectors and what sort of conditions we're attaching to them. And we just like to highlight uh, what we have decided as Greens for the recovery package. Again, this is not about um, like necessarily saving people, saving little businesses uh, right now from going bankrupt and being able to pay their rent. This is about the recovery plan, which is more like a second phase or even third phase, if depending on how many phases you want to name. But for the recovery plan, the big economic investment, what we find important is, as I've already mentioned first, that big companies, including banks, but also insurances and other financial actors, that um, they are aligning their economic activities to the Paris Agreement and that they report about and make it public about how they're going to do that. Um, because uh, if they want to receive public money, then this is public uh, information that needs to be conveyed to the public. Also, of course, if um, we're talking about re economic recovery, it's important that uh, this is not just meant to keep you know, big business alive, but it's meant to avoid layoffs. It's, a, uh, it's meant to uh, avoid uh, unemployment. So we also need a social responsibility from companies that would want to have uh, that investment support, especially also with regards to gender equalities. Then, of course, there's the whole issue of, uh, of dividends, of bonuses for CEOs, etc. And again, if we're spending public money, it has to be in a public interest. And a public interest is not giving huge dividends uh, to shareholders or increasing ridiculous uh, wages even further. So uh, that needs to be done very fair and also um, must exclude um, companies that are busy with evading taxes, because also taxes. Uh, our uh, public money. And uh, of course, the funds also need to be distributed in a transparent way and it needs to be reported back from the member states how they spend, um, what effect it had, if there's been any misuse, because sure that can happen. The important thing is what do we learn from it? Over 
Yeah, uh, speaking of tax, I see a few messages from our friends of the European Anti-Poverty Network, and uh, taxation will be uh, at the heart of uh, the, the financing strategy, because uh, indeed uh, the, the pandemic has already started driving up inequality. Because the, even the confinement is not touching everyone the same way. I mean, those who are forced to live in very uh, 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 small apartments and uh, with, with little access to to uh, parks and, uh, and green places do not suffer the same way as those who enjoy uh, big houses uh, 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 with, uh, with a lot of green spaces uh, uh, nearby. And of course, uh, in terms of income, well, there's some who have uh, uh, massive income or, or, or basically stable incomes and those who, who basically are running on very thin ice. So inequality has already uh, begun to, uh, to go up. And what we know is that 10 years ago, after the global financial crisis, inequality skyrocketed. We can avoid this. I mean, it's no fatality that basically whatever you do when you have a crisis drives up inequality. The, the way you, you design your policies can reduce inequality, actually. And, and Finland is an example after the global financial crisis that also in the 90s, they had an austerity a program that basically uh, ended up being uh, well, taxing the rich more so that inequality went down in society. And that's what we need to do, but indeed taxation and tax cooperation will be huge. What I rejoice is that I think it's going to be much harder for member states to defend uh, old ways of doing things after the pandemic. I mean, how will they defend giving massive tax breaks to big companies who receive massive amounts of public money? How they, will they defend basically uh, tax competition instead of tax cooperation? I really wonder. I think they are going to be on the defensive and believe me, when they are on the defensive, we will be on the offensive on that. We won't be shy. And indeed you might think, well, you guys are, are putting in your, in your recovery plan a lot of things that you've been saying all the uh, uh, for, for decades. It's true. It's true because, well, I believe that indeed, uh, I will not say that we saw the pandemic coming, it's not true, but we saw that our, our, our societies were really, really uh, becoming vulnerable by the day. And we need, you know, we always push for resilience. That is resilience, that means the ability to withstand shocks. And the most efficient you are, the least resilient you are. And we need to rebalance that from less economic efficiency, yes, to more resilience. Resilience costs money, but it brings benefits. And so it's a good way to spend the money uh, uh, you have. So that's one aspect that I wanted to um, uh, to underline. An interesting question is also, should we make the health issues more of an EU competence? That's an interesting question because that drives me to the parallel with asylum and migration. Remember, loads of criticisms against Europe uh, uh, in 2015 because Europe was not doing the right thing in terms of asylum and migration. But let's face it, this was mostly a national competence. Same thing with healthcare. And indeed, I think that what this uh, pandemic shows is that when you have an economic union, when you have a monetary union, when you have a free circulation area, it makes no sense to keep 100% of healthcare policy, 100% of asylum and migration policy national. Actually, a substantial dose of that would need to be federalized, if I can use that word, at European level. Because indeed, there's stuff that crosses borders. There's stuff that, that is local, and you shouldn't mingle, mingle in, into that. But there's stuff like this pandemic that, of course, no, knows of no border. And you would wish that, indeed, uh, our preventative strategies and, and our crisis management uh, uh, abilities when it comes to the pandemic would be European competencies or no. I don't know whether we are going to revise EU treaties anytime soon. I think a change is overdue. I think it's going to be a lengthy thing. Uh, and when we have 10 years to fix climate, maybe this is not the number one priority. But when we put the EU treaties back on the table, we will need to revisit uh, those questions. Should uh, health, uh, health uh, healthcare be 100% a national or, or regional competence? I don't think so. So we need to strike the right balance. It's not putting everything in Brussels, but it's finding really uh, a balance of powers that makes sense and that allows basically decision makers to work for everyone. So we'll certainly come back to that. Yes, and we're almost out of time. Um, so we're going to finish, but I just wanted to highlight one more question, which was asking about specific uh, vulnerable groups and marginalized groups. And that's indeed a big uh, problem because 
um, we see how very often blame for an illness, uh, blame for any sort of danger is being put on uh, people that are already being marginalized. Um, we've seen a lot of discrimination against Roma, for example, in different countries um, and so on and so forth. We also know that access to healthcare is not the same for every sort of group. Um, there's a lot, a lot of problems uh, related to that. Uh, just rest assured that we're very much aware of that. We're also highlighting that in the paper, but for us, it's also very important in all of our policies that we make it inclusive, um, that we make sure that, for example, um, when uh, medicines are being developed, uh, that they're uh, not just developed on the standard uh, male citizen, uh, that disabled people have the same access um, to healthcare and even better access, uh, and that marginalized groups are not just not forgotten, but at, are at the core of any um, resilience and sustainable uh, strategy. Great. Um, I'm afraid we have to stop. Um, we have received dozens and dozens of questions. Thank you all so much for them. I'm really sorry we couldn't answer even half of them. Please have a look at our paper on our website, greensefa.eu, uh, and uh, follow us on social media. And if you have any further questions, you can always reach us there as well. Thank you so much and see you very soon and stay safe and well. Thank you.